The Lost and Found Prince. Story 10 of Fabulous Tales and Fables ASAP by Owen T. Duggan. The Lost and Found Prince. Scene 9. Says the beef man, Take it, it's beef. The three negotiators on their padded lounge chairs in the lobby of the Fuzzy were now the three cashiers. Appletree insisted on sitting upon his blue trunk. It was payment time, that is, either time for them to cough up some cash as promised, or to renege and refuse to pay. Appletree wanted to ask, Why were you so mean as wardens? Prudently, he only asked in his mind, The moment you had keys to a cage, you changed. It happened so quickly. You are not bad people, surely. Why were you so mean? In his mind alone, they answered, Be cruel to be kind, Mr. Appletree. That's the way. Try it some time. You should have let us drag him away. His answer to that was, No. But his answer to money was, Yes, please, for they did pay him. He accepted a thin collection of paper banknotes and a thick leather pouch of coins, saying, My gratitude to the family Rudigal. They are most generous. He inspected the coins, as was his right, quite a pleasant surprise. Besides some standard silver thaler coins, which he expected, there was silver minted long ago. A Rudigal family treasure hoard, dug up in a field, very acceptable, wherever it came from. The trio did not like him. Their crossed arms and pursed lips said they were glad to see him go. Did they choose to read on his face a smug grin of superiority? Who could say? He was giving them not his courteous, introductory smile, but a new one, a genuinely joyful one, for he had experienced a victory, and he was happy about it. Sure, he had witnessed Beresivi Rudigal recover against the odds, but he himself, Appletree, had changed. After so many years, he had learned something new. He had taken a risk, and, though he was not sure how, it paid off. Plus, literally, he had just been paid off. In cash. Nice. The old staff geezer at the Fuzzy intruded. Uh, Sorry to interfere, but uh, the coach is coming soon. Appletree told him, My friend, don't worry so much about interfering. To be alive is to interfere. No point in sticking around, Appletree took his leave. Hotel staff helped lug his trunk out the door, and once outdoors, friendly faces approached in a little parade, led by the beef man himself. Sir Appletrees, he said. Doctor, I mean. His arms were laden, and his back supported a heavy wooden frame with a mighty iron pot. The rich smell of roasted beef wafted and whirled, I'll just lay this here a minute, he said, and he unloaded his arms upon the blue trunk and began to struggle out of his back frame. Next came his skinny son, holding nothing. Maybe he was supposed to hold doors? He at once helped his father out of the shoulder straps. Then came the beef wife, married, of course, to the beef man, with a huge basket. She lay that, too, upon the trunk. We're on our way to see Beresivi. Will you join us? She said. The basket smelled like bread, because that's what was in it. Last in the parade came a young farm woman with two pots hung from a shoulder yoke. Not iron pots, but tin. Full of hot food, they missed it a little. Appletree told them, Thank you, but he was full to bursting, and he was waiting for the after-lunch coach. But go ahead to his house, he said. He's there, ready for company, and probably hungry. 
the beef man zipped into the fuzzy to invite the three paymasters. In his absence, the beef wife said, Oh, and this is our son. You've seen him before. The son was busy balancing the wood frame, keeping the beef from spilling. Yes, and I presume this is your daughter, said the doctor, watching the wholesome farm girl set her pots upon the paver stones. Daughter? Not exactly, said the beef wife. This is our milkmaiden, Cowfield. That was her father's name, you see. I did try to make her my daughter-in-law, but my son, bless his tender heart, assures me he doesn't see her in that way. Judging from the son's tender smirk, the boy didn't see any girl in that way, said the doctor. Nice to meet you, Miss Cowfield. The young woman smiled graciously, memorably, and the beef man was back with the trio's answer to his invitation. They're not coming, he said plainly. It was no surprise. They say the place is clean. Marissavi recovered his wits, and they're done with it all. Sure you won't join us, doctor? Our beef is fed on grass of hallowed fields, don't you know? But it was time. A fresh team of horses pulled up, flexing, stamping, and jerking. Tail swatting, snorting, and bristling. They were ready. Passengers were showing up. At least take this, said the beef man, gifting the doctor with food wrapped in wax paper. For the road. Take it. It's beef. It'll last. It's dried and cured. Cured, like Beresovi, get it? We can't thank you enough, his wife said. Don't thank me, said Appletree. I hardly did anything. And they thanked me in cash. If anyone, thank that elderly matron who makes the aprons. Beresovi started speaking after she came by. It's for the banquet, she said. Though I never saw her, and Beresovi said the same thing. It's for the banquet. Oh, you may as well take this back to the house. I wasn't sure if I should keep it or not. Oh, don't you want to keep it? I do want to keep it. That's why it means more if I don't. He handed Miss Cowfield the apron he had. It was the newest one, and at this point, the only one. Accepting it, the milkmaid inspected the image with the front picture of the princely gentleman. She ran her fingers along the stitches and seams. The picture panel was also a pocket, as Dr. Appletree had learned earlier. The maiden flipped out the pocket to reveal the underside of the stitched figure, the chaotic tangle of threads. Then she rested, content, and smiled. Graciously, she nodded. Just a second said Dr. Appletree. Don't let the coach leave without me. He darted across the road. To the ruins. To center place. As he patted the ruins for good luck, as prescribed by local custom, a mob of older street kids showed up, cracking jokes. Hey, that's Dr. Applebaum! <laughs> <laughs> he looks haggardly. He faced them. He humored them, and said, I only dress poor, so thieves can't tell how rich I am. Would they grow up to be bandits, or heroes of the town, fathers, or corpses in a war? It was a passing thought. Oh, so you came for the cash, not for charity. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I had to accept the money, for your sake, he said. If I refused... The town would automatically be cursed. That's how it works. You'd be turned into carnival dancers. You'd never be able to stop moving. You want that? No? Hardy, hardy, har. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> we don't believe you. What'll you do with all the money, Dr. Applebags? <laughs> Why, I'll buy some decent clothes, won't I? I'll buy some decent threads. Appletree caught that after-lunch coach and did something unusual when the coach reached the river landing, for he saw there was a caravan of modest nomadic families 
whose language he had once taken time to try and learn, he gave them his blue trunk. They could sell the contents as they liked, clothing and medicines, playing cards, and props for magic tricks and entertainment, some soap, and some nice polished stones, some wood carvings, some colored wax, and a few bottles of olive oil. His load became as light as his mood. From there, a boat would carry him downstream to the coast of the somber sea, and along its shores to the city that was his home. Bon voyage! Denouement scene Says the beef wife Proud of you, Sonny Baresivi Rudigal Would live happily And lack for nothing True He never got to be head man of town Some cousin filled that role And true Nan never came to see Beresivi, for she moved away. His consolation, prosperity, and happiness was to come otherwise. In what way? In this way. Once, in a time that will have come to pass, Beresivi met Lindy. Lindy called him Rudy. Rudy and Lindy built a life together. Upon meeting and talking at length about the supposedly enchanted aprons, Lindy discovered she had a powerful talent for stitchwork adornment. Her fingers were nimble, her manner was tender. She spent time with the apron lady, who lived one final year. Lindy carried on the craft, adorning aprons and designing them as well, Beyond kitchen aprons, she made some for milking cows. They were waterproofed with oiled fabric. Together, they conceived a line of blacksmithing aprons that would not catch fire. These did not have oiled fabric. A masonry apron was to come with handy pockets. It never ripped, guaranteed, being plied in multiple layers the warp and weft of the weave at all angles. A baby's bib was made for happy sloppy feeding times. Light and easily rinsed, it was disposable. And so on. The craft expanded into a cottage industry for the household of Rudy and Lindy, employing neighbors. One special product was a lucky laced fertility penny, recommended to newlywed women to wear while serving tea to their husbands. As for that, for fertility, Rudy and Lindy had many kids, even taking in a young half-brother of Beresivi suddenly, as well as adopting a pair of kids who needed a home and who touched their hearts. All their kids mixed and made lifelong friends among neighbors. Father might have been proud, one would expect, but, like Nan, he never visited. Life was so full and busy, there was food to prepare, stories to tell, aprons to make and to sell. Mostly there would be creatures great and small, wild and tamed, featured on pockets and chest panels with Rudy as quality controller, making sure the images came to life in vivid colors, whether of animals, people, or plants. The sales motto was, Our aprons are the only ones you'll need. And they also joked that, Our aprons are the only clothes you'll need. There was no point in hiding the past. Daddy's breakdown was told as a story to their toddlers. The boys got to hear it as once in a time past. 
Daddy was turned into a chicken by the emperor's arch enemy, an evil sorcerer named Warmonger, and Lord Applebum showed up to shatter the spell. The version told to the girls was, Once, in a time past, Daddy was turned into a chicken by the emperor's arch enemy, an evil witch named Warmonger, and Lady Applestrings showed up to snap the spell. How? How? This was done by whispering a magic healing word. But what is the word? What is the word? Well, you have to come closer. You have to give me your ear. And the word is... And the teller, whether Rudy or Lindy, would say or do whatever came to mind. So yes, happiness was to come. But first came beef. The herbs in the roast were reaching everyone nearby, like incense at a shrine. Neighbors and dogs and kids caught wind of it and forgot about games and gossip and troubles. The beef parade, coming from the fuzzy inn at the center of town, arrived at the large house and were immediately granted entry at a door already wide, said the beef man. Thought you might be hungry, said the skinny son. Wow! Impressed as he was by a bale of fragrant lilacs on the countertop, food bearers set things on tables, plates and forks, a bottle of wine, water, butter, a platter of smoked auspec cheese, and two tin pots which held boiled potato and turnip and steamed kale greens. The beef wife gave Beresevi a great big hug, pressing her bosom into his chest and saying, I'm proud of you, Sonny, proud of you. He warmed to the embrace, accepted it, and hugged back. Over the beef wife's soft shoulder, his teary eyes met the gracious eyes of Cowfield, the milkmaid, to whom he was about to be introduced. He would not call her Cowfield for long, of course, because for the rest of his life he would call her Lindy. You have just listened to The Lost and Found Prince, Story 10 of Fabulous Tales and Fables ASAP by Owen T. Duggan. Just a second, said Appletree. <laughs> Rudy, that's a pretty good one, Rudy.